Chinese real estate company Evergrande's crisis isn't over. Hundreds of home buyers are protesting as construction on their future homes has been suspended for months. Reports of China's so-called tofu buildings strike again. Four are dead after a residential worker storm collapsed in the middle of the night. China's birth rate plummets to its lowest point in four decades. This despite authorities' efforts to encourage a baby boom. A young man from Wuhan announces his decision to quit the Chinese Communist Party. He's one of around 400 million Chinese people that have abandoned their ties to the CCP. And China is exerting pressure on a small European country related to tensions over Taiwan. But the U.S. defends the country and offers a trade deal worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. First, we look to the most indebted real estate company, Evergrande. Hundreds of Evergrande property owners are protesting. They picketed a municipal government building in a southeastern city on Monday. They said they had paid for their unfinished properties, but construction had been suspended for months. A housing development in southwestern China's Chongqing city is running into problems after real estate company Evergrande halted construction for months. Some homeowners are complaining online, saying they spent their entire family's lifetime savings to purchase their properties. But now there seems to be little hope their future houses will ever be finished. The homeowners went to the municipal government today to appeal to solve the problem. An official from the Petition Bureau received the request, but it's not clear when construction will resume. It depends on how long it takes the funds to arrive. To protect Ms. Chen's identity, we're using her last name only. She explained she paid full price for the home back in April, over $300,000. She said that the property and others near hers were supposed to be completed in 2024, but notes construction has been suspended for months. They have stopped working. We asked several times. They always say they'll resume the work, but they haven't so far. Chen says she handed over hard-earned money for the promise of a home. But Evergrande's decision to suspend construction has become a hardship for her family. Wasn't Evergrande one of the world's top 500 companies? We thought it was financially strong, and it was also a big company. We'd never have thought it would shut down for three months. We are in the first phase. We signed the contract for the full price, and the contract said we would get the house delivered next year. But now it's not clear when we'll get it. A real estate agent in the city pointed out that a number of Evergrande property developments have faced suspension across China. That's because the company doesn't have the money to fund them. There's no compensation plan. Now Evergrande simply has no money. Many homeowners are fighting it. Evergrande is the world's most in-debt developer, facing more than $300 billion in liabilities. Recently, it's been grappling to meet one debt repayment deadline after another. To avoid a default on its debts, Evergrande's been selling some of its assets. It recently sold its streaming services branch. The deal last week brought in $270 million. Reports of a residential building collapse are coming out of China. The incident killed four people in a case that echoes concerns over Chinese construction safety. The building served as a dormitory for local workers at a pharmaceutical plant located in the southern Chinese province of Jiangxi. The six-story structure collapsed on Monday evening. Chinese state-run media reported that the search for victims concluded Tuesday morning. They confirmed all four people who had been buried in the debris had died. NTD cannot independently verify this information. Media reports also explained that a family living on the first floor started hearing strange noises right before the collapse. They managed to escape just in time. The building was built around 30 years ago in the 90s. The cause of the collapse is still under investigation. China has sought to improve construction quality and industrial safety. But accidents are still known to occur, with some companies cutting corners to lower costs. Tofu buildings have long been a big problem in China. The name comes from the quality of construction, which is said to be as unstable as tofu. Videos circulating online show some of these types of buildings. 
Over the weekends, part of a high-rise building's facade peeled off. And in Beijing, video shows a man scraping away at part of a wall with his bare hands. In the clip, someone asks, didn't they use any cement? Population woes in China. The birth rate is falling in most industrialized countries, but China's the most marked. Birth rates there have dipped to their lowest level in more than four decades. Despite the authorities' efforts to encourage a baby boom, most Chinese people still want fewer marriages and fewer babies. There were less than 10 births for every 1,000 citizens in the country last year. That's less than half what it was decades ago. That's according to China's latest statistical yearbook, released over the weekend. There are also fewer marriages. Only about 8 million couples got married, compared with over 13 million the year before. Although China is not the only country to worry about population woes, its birth rate is falling more drastically than most countries. According to the World Data Atlas, the overall global birth rate was 18 per thousand people last year. That's double the number of China's birth rate. Chinese officials blamed the pandemic for the dramatic drop. But others pointed to Beijing's decades of interventionist policies on childbirth. A nationwide one-child policy was implemented in 1979 to slow population growth. It ran until 2015. Those who violated the rules faced fines, unemployment and even forced abortions. The policy is also blamed for China's gender imbalance, with males outnumbering females by more than 30 million in 2019, which directly led to a lack of women who could bear children. But in recent years, Chinese authorities have been seeking to reverse the trend and fix the baby bust by relaxing the rules on birth limits and other measures. But that reform failed. Most people can't afford more than one child, as the cost of raising a family is rising. As a result, China has seen a steady decline in the birth rate since 2017, and experts say the worst is yet to come. As similar problems within China continue to surface, next we look at another issue tied to Beijing. Three more Chinese people are speaking out about a major decision to quit the Chinese Communist Party. They join around 400 million Chinese people that have abandoned their ties to the CCP and its affiliated organizations. The three people announced their choice to quit through a U.S.-based website hosted by the Global Service Center for Quitting the CCP. One of them is a young man from Wuhan. He declared he would cut ties with the party last month. He gave himself the pseudonym Xiang Yi to protect his identity and to keep himself and his family inside China safe. On the Toidang website, visitors to the page can quit the Communist Party via pseudonym. This method is widely used to avoid possible retaliation from Beijing. Yi says the whole process started last year. That's when he learned how to overcome China's internet blockade and visit websites that are censored in the country. He recounted feeling awful after reading about Beijing's early cover-up of the CCP virus, which causes COVID-19. Especially considering his hometown of Wuhan, the epicenter of the initial outbreak. He also described researching Beijing's decision not to close its airports. That led to large numbers of people leaving the country, allowing the virus to spread quickly around the world. He calls the treatment of Wuhan citizens at the time inhuman. In the early stages of pandemic prevention, the CCP treated us like animals, just shut us in at home. As for grocery supplies during lockdown, the videos posted online about garbage trucks transporting food are all true. Alongside Yi's decision to quit the party, two others announced they would leave the Young Pioneers Organization. That's the Communist Party's youth organization. Almost all Chinese children are made to join the organization, with the youngest of them just six years old. Yang Li and Qingmen are among those who joined at young ages, but their views of the party began to shift when authorities forcibly demolished their homes. Our own home was taken away by the party. We have been petitioning to defend our rights, but are constantly suppressed. We have seen through the evil party. It's a demon. We look forward to the day when the Communist Party will face punishment. We denounce our ties to its affiliated organization, the Young Pioneers. The movement to quit the CCP began more than 10 years ago, organized by the Global Service Center for Quitting the Chinese Communist Party. It's headquartered in New York and has more than 100 service centers across the world. That's in addition to its web presence. The center seeks to educate people around the world about the dangers of communism. 
The International Olympic Committee is facing growing scrutiny after its recent video call with Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai. The conversation and what the IOC is not disclosing about it has got people asking more questions. Will Ripley has more. She was part of this movie. Free Peng Shuai, the growing call of protesters, Peng Shuai politicians, professional athletes. A global outcry for the Chinese tennis star many fear is being silenced. It's time to speak up because there is less than 100 days till the Winter Olympics. The International Olympic Committee trying to calm the controversy. An IOC statement seems to support the Chinese government narrative that the three-time Olympian is safe and well, despite growing concern for her freedom. The IOC handing out this single image Sunday of a 30-minute video call between Peng, IOC President Tomas Bach, and two other officials asking to, quote, respect her privacy. An IOC official on the call says, I was relieved to see that Peng Shuai was doing fine, which was our main concern. Some suggest the governing body's real concern is not Peng, but profits. The IOC statement fails to mention Peng's explosive allegations three weeks ago that one of China's most senior communist leaders, photographed with the IOC's Bach in 2016, sexually assaulted her. Unlike the IOC, the Women's Tennis Association prepared to pull hundreds of millions of dollars in business out of China, demanding direct communication with Peng, unmonitored, uncensored. The WTA telling CNN, this video does not change our call for a full, fair, and transparent investigation without censorship. In the history books look back at this time, they will say the WTA, what an incredible masterclass in humanitarian leadership, the right way to do it, to call China on its abuses, and the International Olympic Committee sitting there, as they always do, basically doing nothing. Which some say makes the IOC complicit in the apparent silencing of a tennis icon who dared to speak out against former Vice Premier Zhang Gaoli. He's known to keep a low profile, portrayed in Chinese propaganda as down to earth, a crusader against corruption. The Communist Party will deal with this as an internal matter. I really doubt that they will actually refer this to prosecutors of the state, because uh, that would uh, raise just too many issues. It, all senior leaders have the goods on everybody else. The United States, France, and the UK have expressed concerns about Peng Shuai, and tennis players, including Naomi Osaka, Serena Williams, Novak Djokovic, and Billie Jean King, also join the list of those backing Peng. A small European country is facing China's fury after it strengthened its ties with Taiwan. The U.S. is offering that country assistance, and the European Union is taking a side too. Here's more. China voiced strong dissatisfaction with the EU member nation Lithuania on Sunday and downgraded their diplomatic ties. That's after Lithuania allowed Taiwan to open a de facto embassy there. But at a news conference, the country's prime minister says she does not regret her decision. Lithuania wants a more intense economic, cultural and scientific relationship with Taiwan. It was announced in the government program and this should not have been a surprise to anyone. Beijing views the self-ruled and democratically governed Taiwan as its territory with no rights to the trappings of a state. It has stepped up pressure on other countries to downgrade or sever their relations with the island, even for non-official ties. On Monday, China's foreign ministry demanded that Lithuania end its newly enhanced relationship with Taiwan and threatened Lithuania, saying, The decision was made at the expense of Lithuania's own interests. But Lithuania defended its right to expand cooperation with Taiwan and said its foreign minister would go to Washington to discuss trade and investment projects. On Friday, a U.S. official said Lithuania would sign a $600 million trade deal with the U.S. On the same day, another U.S. official warned what they termed other countries against threatening Lithuania. Reaffirm our support for our valued NATO ally and EU partner Lithuania. Uh, we reject attempts by other countries to interfere in Lithuania's sovereign decision to deepen cooperation uh, with Taiwan. Earlier on Friday, China warned Lithuania it would take all necessary measures in response to Lithuania's Taiwan office. The Taiwanese representative office in Lithuania finally opened last Thursday. 
South Korea is caught in the middle of a growing rivalry between the U.S. and China. Washington recently stopped a South Korean microchip maker from shipping advanced equipment to its factory in China. U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai says the move was made out of legitimate concerns about the risks to national security. Here's more. During an interview with South Korean broadcaster CBS, which aired on Monday, Ambassador Catherine Tai was asked about the U.S. banning a South Korean chip maker from installing advanced equipment at its factory in China. I am aware of this issue, and I'm also aware that the technology in question is highly sensitive mm -hmm. and that there are legitimate concerns about the risks to national security in terms of where this technology ends up. The company, SK Hynix, was planning to ship some extreme ultraviolet lithography machines to its factory in Wuxi, China. The machines are used to create the most advanced microchips, but Washington barred the move. Tai said that it's important for the U.S. to work with its partners and allies, in particular, on matters of shared economic and national security. I also want to acknowledge that um, we consider Korea to be one of our most important national security partners. Mm. Tai added that when it comes to national security, which includes military and defense concerns, other items could also come under such regulations down the road. SK Hynix CEO Lee Sahee said earlier that his company will respond to the issue wisely while cooperating with interested parties. Tai was on a four-day trip to South Korea since last Thursday. During the visit, she stressed cooperation with Seoul to address global supply chain challenges, especially in the semiconductor sector. Now the Biden administration is planning to set up a new Asian economic framework with allies and friendly nations. Tai had already visited Japan last week and starting Monday she'll be in New Delhi, India. The Philippine Navy transported food supplies to Marines guarding a disputed shoal in the South China Sea, and China kept close watch of them from nearby ships. But there was no major incident. The Philippines Defense Secretary said that two boats reached the Marines Tuesday. Those Marines were stationed on a military ship at 2nd Thomas Shoal. A Chinese Coast Guard ship deployed a rubber boat to get closer and take photos and videos. The Filipino boats were there without a military escort, as the Chinese embassy requires. But a Philippine military plane did fly over the shoal. Last week, the Chinese Navy blocked Philippine supply boats using water cannons. And on Monday, Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte slammed Beijing over the incident. The shoal has been surrounded by Chinese surveillance ships in the years-long territorial standoff. The Philippines says the shoal is in its internationally recognized exclusive economic zone. But the Chinese communist regime insists it has sovereignty over the waters. Beijing is trapped in disputes about waters with some of its Southeast Asian neighbors, including the Philippines. Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia and Indonesia. On land, Beijing has been in conflict with India over border disputes. And in the South China Sea, China has transformed seven shoals into missile-protected island bases to cement its assertions, ratcheting up tensions. Chinese Communist leader Xi Jinping is trying to take China in a new direction, which would have a major impact on the international community. A China affairs analyst speaks with NTD. Communist leader Xi Jinping wants to steer the future of China. In doing so, he's presenting a new interpretation of the past. Ahead of next year's National Congress, the Communist Party approved a summary of its 100-year history earlier this month, called the Historical Resolution. It's a big deal, as this marks only the third time ever the party has released such a document. And each time it happened in the past, the party changed its direction. This time, China affairs analyst Tong Jingyuan says the new direction is aimed at gaining global supremacy. It's very likely that in the future, the direction of Xi Jinping's policies will shift to a state that's more and more adversarial toward the international community. The first two historical resolutions were passed back in the 40s and 80s by then leaders Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, respectively. In the second version, Deng criticized Mao's cultural revolution and started to reform China from a centrally planned economy to a market system. But compared to those earlier editions, Xi Jinping's version uses a very different rhetoric. 
In the second historical resolution, we can see that there's a large section that condemns Mao's personality cult and dictatorial actions. In this third historical resolution, that all disappeared. Xi's version makes overwhelmingly more mention of himself than his predecessors, most of it praise. That may coincide with the 2018 removal of China's two-term limit for the head of the Communist Party. This could effectively allow him to stay in power indefinitely. There's another obvious omission. In a section glorifying and summarizing the CCP's rule over the country, another of Deng's famous phrases for China's economic reform, sticking to reform and openness, is nowhere to be seen. Xi Jinping has in fact rejected the economic construction-centered direction through this third historical resolution. He's likely to turn a policy direction based on political struggle, as Mao did. Tang says Xi could believe that it's his historic responsibility to establish a new world order for China. His ambition is displayed in multiple efforts. China's Belt and Road Infrastructure Plan, increased emphasis on digital currency, and the internationalization of Chinese currency, the yuan. But Tang adds, Xi's ambitions are also being met with major pushback, both inside and outside the country. We can see that Xi Jinping is now facing an unprecedented, isolated international environment. This is closely related to the political direction he's pursuing. He must have resistance inside the party. But so far, there isn't any strong evidence to prove it could block him from pursuing that route. Tong says it's hard to see what's really going on within the party because of the lack of transparency. But he says overall, the conclusion of this third ever historical resolution is simple that the Communist Party is ready to turn the page on a new chapter, but it might be a less peaceful one under Xi. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching. But before you go, here's a glimpse into Wednesday's special report. Chinese health authorities are welding people's doors shut. They're locking citizens' doors with steel chains and lining hallways with barbed wire. But what's behind the extreme actions? The tactics seek to block people from leaving their homes. Just one aspect of China's strict virus prevention and control strategy. It's known as Beijing's zero COVID policy, an effort to completely eliminate the virus from inside Chinese borders. and has been in place since the beginning of the first outbreak. In this week's special report, we examine some of China's draconian pandemic measures and look at what Beijing's policy really means for its citizens.